Number 10, Tamerlane the Great. How about Tamerlane the not great dude? Oh, that's so bad. Tamerlane was a great conqueror of the Turks who was infamous for building a tower of skulls. This man will make you thankful for democracy or just like everything we have today, if you weren't already. He ruled around 40 years until he died in 1405 CE. He was a huge fan of Genghis Khan and he believed he was his descendant. He wasn't directly on his father's side, but he kind of was. And based on what we know of Genghis Khan, not hard to believe he had a lot of kids. To pay homage to his great grandfather, he built an empire that stretched across Russia, the Mediterranean, and India. No mercy was his motto, annihilating whole cities in one fell sweep. He burned down a mosque in Damascus with people still inside just to heighten the fear. One of the most gruesome things he ever did was behead over 90,000 people, enough to build a hundred towers of decaying skulls. Right? Unlike his idol Genghis Khan, his brutal campaign wasn't about protecting trade routes and flanks, but more about, you know, bragging rights and power. The Timurid Empire didn't survive for very long because they never put in any governmental structures after they destroyed their territory. So it's kind of like once you just conquer somewhere, you have to take care of it after, but he didn't. In other words, he may have conquered many places, but he never truly ruled after he destroyed them. He killed around 19 million people, probably more, during his conquests and skinned alive any who wouldn't convert to Islam. Whew! Vicious! Vicious! Number nine, Issei Sagawa. Man, I can't believe this dude is just like walking around free. It really freaks me out. I don't want to forget this man exists at all. So if I ever see him, I can run in the opposite direction and as should you. In 1981, Sagawa took the life of Renee Hartfeld and then he ate her. Yeah. He took two days to consume her and apparently this crime had fulfilled a lifelong desire for Sagawa. He did try to get diagnosed by a psychiatrist who actually declared him highly dangerous, but because he was the son of a rich Japanese businessman, rather than getting, um, help, his father sent him to school in Savorn, France. Issei apparently had the desire when he saw his classmates thighs while at school and he thought they looked delicious. Ugh. While at school in France, he finally met his target, Renee. The two became friends, well, on her end. She had no idea what was about to happen. Thankfully, she wouldn't have realized what was about to happen as he shot her in the back, which is like a really, really, really small mercy. Ugh, I'm glad she wasn't like cognizant. He selected her because of her youth and beauty and Issei wanted to absorb her energy so he wouldn't be as weak. He packed up what was left of her corpse into a suitcase and took a cab over to a park and dropped them off. But bystanders saw the blood leaking and called the police. He admitted it, was declared insane, as he already was, deported back to Japan where he was supposed to stay in a mental institution, but they declared him sane. And since the case was dropped in France, he only had to stay for 15 months in the institution and he is now free, walks the streets and says he still has the same desires. Uh huh? Number eight, the killer actor. A black mark on the profession, no doubt. Ramiro Artaida was so set on revenge and coercion that he went to acting school so he could be better at it, right? Between 1937 and 1939, Ramiro was responsible for the gruesome deaths of over eight women. His thing was that he would create characters in order to lure women to secluded areas. His go-tos were a monk, a film producer, and a professor. The motivation behind his killing spree was related to the accusation made against him years before. Ramiro was engaged to be married and he came from a wealthy estate. He was accused of killing his older brother in order to ensure that the estate passed solely to him. And it was due to these accusations that that his fiance left him, but nothing was proven. Distraught, he fled Bolivia and studied drama in the US only to return and exact revenge on any women who looked like his ex. Like talk about a dramatic breakup. Thankfully he was caught and sentenced to death in 1939. Yikes. Number seven, the great blood sorceress. What a name, right? Next up we have Magdalena Solis who unfortunately earned the bad nickname of the Great Blood Sorceress. Why was this woman so evil? Well, she was a cult leader who manipulated and tormented her followers due to her warped sense of self. A religious fanatic with an already delusional sense of who she was, she joined the Santos Cayetano Hernandez cult in 1963 in Mexico. She traveled with the cult to Urba Buena, a town with a tiny population of only 50 people, all sadly destitute and poor. She took severe advantage of the people, convincing them that she was the reincarnation of an Aztec god. Goddess. 
okay? I don't know if you know anything about the Aztec tradition, but whoa. The brothers who founded the group knew it was fake, but Magdalena even sold herself on the charade. She was responsible for eight confirmed deaths, though probably more. They died due to the gruesome ritual sacrifices she performed on them. Like, think Temple of Doom, Indiana Jones, like, like that. That's exactly what she did. Ugh. This woman would torment and beat them, then take out their hearts and drink their blood. Like, ugh. Just horrendous. I hate this. It's just gross. Don't join cults. Anyways. Number six, Delphine LaLaurie. It was only a matter of time before Delphine LaLaurie made it onto this list, and I know you've been waiting. LaLaurie first caught suspicion over her cruelty when a servant girl threw herself off of a balcony whilst being chased by LaLaurie. But the real horrors were revealed when rescuers found a 70 year old slave woman chained to the stove during a house fire. The woman had set the fire herself and tried to take her own life for fear her punishment would lead her to the attic. When authorities ventured up to the attic themselves, they saw several bodies of servants mutilated and hung by the neck. Needless to say, the whole town was set ablaze after that with anger. A mob surrounded the LaLaurie mansion with the desire of confronting and punishing the cruel woman, but she had disappeared. To this day, no one knows what happened to her. I mean, she's definitely dead. She was so ruined, but as to where and how, no one knows. But she was never properly punished for her crimes. Number five, Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm actually surprised Dahmer hasn't made it onto this list until now, but here he is. What creeps me out the most about Dahmer is his awareness that what he was doing was wrong. He just couldn't help himself. With a genius level IQ of 145, Dahmer was a ticking time bomb. His desire to mutilate started out the way you expect with animals as a young child, but prior to his rise to crime, he fell to alcohol abuse and dropped out of business school before enlisting in the US Army. According to Dahmer, he knew what he wanted to do, but he just hadn't found the opportunity. But he was discharged after attacking two fellow soldiers, and it was after this that he began pursuing the title of the Milwaukee Cannibal, which is what he became later. Between 1971 and 1991, he killed 17 men in a variety of gruesome ways and celebrated each and every one. One of the things he did that I wish I didn't know was he attempted to make a human zombie by drilling into his victims' heads. Uh, one of his victims escaped and notified police. When they got there, the chief medical examiner remarked, it was more like dismantling someone's museum than an actual crime scene. Dahmer was killed behind bars by another inmate in 1994. Number three, Andre Chikatilo. I think the creepiest and most evil people are the ones you least expect, and that's what terrifies me about this guy. I would take a poltergeist any day over someone like Andre. Andre was a teacher in the Soviet Union, trusted by so many, but little did anyone know he took the lives of 50 young people before he was caught. His case actually inspired the book Child 44 by Tom Rob Smith, which is actually one of my favorites by the way, couldn't put it down. The reason he was able to get away with the killings for so long was because of the USSR. Crimes like this didn't exist in Stalin's Russia, so these events were often covered up at the scene, so it was easy for criminals like this to get away. Meanwhile, Andre was addicted to taking the lives of these women as it was the only way he could achieve satisfaction. The reason he was so pathologically messed up started in his early childhood. Stalin's agricultural policies caused widespread famine, and from part one we know he's not a good guy himself. But Andre was believed to have suffered from water on the brain at birth, causing him to get frequent UTIs and often wet his bed. He was also bullied due to his father's capture in World War II because it was seen as cowardly. Whatever the cause may be, he still committed some vicious crimes and thankfully he was arrested in the 1990s. And though we have sympathy for him, man, take takes a certain kind of person to do something so horrible. Number one, Norway terror. July 2011 was a horrific day for the people of Norway after 77 people were killed by right wing extremist Anders Ryewick. At 3.26 p.m. on July 22nd, a fertilizer bomb went off outside the building of the Prime Minister. Eight people were killed. After that, Anders ventured to Utoya Island wearing a police uniform. Young adults were at a Labour Party youth camp on which Anders opened fire, taking out anyone who tried to escape. Finally, at 6.27, he was taken into custody by the Norwegian police unit. Beyond the 69 young adults whose lives were taken, 319 people were injured and a later study showed that one in four people in Norway knew someone who had been there. This was the worst crime ever committed in Norway and with one in four Norwegians having known someone, it hit very close to home to many of them. But the worst part about Anders is that though he admitted to the crime, he denied responsibility because the crimes were necessary. The saddest part about making these lists is that there really is no shortage of awful people in the world. The best we can do is try to be one of the good ones. Kicking off the list at number 10, George Chapman. This list is bad 
insane so fair warning of the content that will follow it's actually really dark i try and be a silly goose whenever i can but this list honestly i have like two bits maybe in total we'll see so hang in there is what i'm trying to say let's do it starting off with george chapman we're going back to the late 1800s for this guy he began his career as a polish doctor but in 1888 he moved to london and that's when things got dicey to say the least once in london chapman sought out four mistresses despite as the late rob ford once said having more than enough to eat at home i'm happily married I've got more than enough to eat at home. Thank yeah, he was our mayor. Fun fact, gotta love Ontario. But George Chapman was a doctor. He was a cheater and George Chapman was a killer. He poisoned all four of these women with arsenic. Chapman was executed for these crimes in 1903. And this guy was so bad that they thought perhaps he could have been Jack the Ripper, but that's since been disproven. So I guess he's still out there. That's a horrible thought to end on. That was just one out of 10. Like I said, buckle up. Number nine, Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood. This one is a two for one in terms of awful people. Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood. They were both working together at a nursing home in Michigan. And together, they both took the lives of five patients. They would do so by smothering them with a pillow. How awful is that? And to make this even more twisted, if such a thing can exist in this case, they did these attacks to prove their love to one another. Luckily, they were caught and locked up in 1989, but the fact that they worked together to carry out these attacks legit gives me the creeps. I didn't like typing about this or researching this. It's an awful thing to learn. This list is full of the worst doctors, but this pair, I don't know why, it just sticks with me right in here. Number eight, Elizabeth Wetlaufer. She was once a nurse at several long-term care facilities in Southern Ontario. Yep, really hitting close to home for this one. Elizabeth Wetlaufer would use lethal doses of insulin to end the lives of her patients. Now, after the patient had passed away, Elizabeth would then steal their opioids to support her own addiction. So it's bad, and then it just gets worse. In 2016, she quit her nursing job, checked herself into a psychiatric hospital, and confessed to all of her crimes. She confessed to eight counts of first-degree murder. Four counts of attempted and two counts of aggravated assault. These happened from 2007 to 2016 in Woodstock, Ontario. So very close to where I am right now. Don't come find me and kill me. Thanks. Elizabeth is now 55. She's serving eight concurrent life sentences, but after 25 years, thanks to Canadian law, she gets a chance at parole because, you know, second chances. Am I right? There's things I love about being a Canadian, but like this, how they handle monsters like this is not one of them. Number seven, Morris Bulber. He was once part of the Philadelphia Poison Ring, which, yep, was a real thing. How horrible does that sound already? The Philadelphia Poison Ring. Okay, I'll talk about that first. It was led by these two Italian cousins, Paul and Herman Petrillo. This was back in the 1930s, and these two bros were perfect for each other in an awful way. Always the pairs, always the awful pairs. Harold was the arsonist who knew how to make counterfeit money, and Paul, he ran an insurance scam out of the back of his tailor business. Bad news in every direction. So already this awful duo exists. And then in comes Morris Bulber, this Russian Jewish immigrant who believed in something called La Fatura, which was this magical practice that Italians from South Philadelphia believed in at the time. Also so specific, just specific amount of Italians from Southern Philadelphia. Okay, just avoid that place, I guess. But this Dr. Bulber would give potions to their patients. And it was specifically patients from these cousins because they issued insurance policies without medical exams. So they would get this Dr. Bulber to poison them with arsenic. The reason they had this scheme was because their insurance policies would then pay out the gang rather than the now widowed wives. How horrible is that? When they didn't need Dr. Evil, the cousins would just hire thugs to drown victims or hit them with their cars. Horrible stuff like that. This kicked off around 1931 and roughly 50 people bit the bullet before he was finally arrested in 1939. And yes, he turned the evidence over so that these two cousins were also found guilty. Everyone got f***ed in this one. They were both sentenced to death. So just everyone got the most horrible treatment in every sense. Number six, John Bodkin Adams. He was once a general practitioner in the British community in Essex and most of his patients were that of the elderly and he treated those patients with care. From 1946 to 1956, John had around 160 patients that died suspiciously, and out of all those 160, 132 of them left valuables for him after they passed away. What are the odds, right? Now, of course, the wills were later found out to be fraudulent because, well, of course, this list exists. And the worst part of all this is that John was acquitted. His trial established the doctrine of double effect, which is where a doctor giving treatment with the aim of relieving pain may lawfully, as an unintentional result, shorten their life. But like that many times, come on. So out of the dozens of cases that ended horribly, Adams was only charged for two of them. He wasn't even convicted of their deaths. He was guilty of forging prescriptions and falsifying medical forms. He even reopened his practice afterwards, but this time around, patients avoided him. Number five, Jane Toppin. It's the 1880s and Jane Toppin, AKA Jolly Jane, is now confessing to 31 murders. With that nickname and that many victims, 
you're probably just as shook as I was writing this. Jolly Jane Toppin was a nurse working in Massachusetts. She would take care of the elderly as well. It's always something to do in that case, horrible. But instead of TLC, Jane would give them morphine and atropine. And while they were slowly fading away, Jane would do the absolute creepiest thing I've ever heard of. She would poison these old folks and then lie in their bed with them while they were passing away. Like literally beside them. That's the worst thing I've ever had to tell somebody out loud. That's horrible. I couldn't imagine doing something like this. She managed to take the lives of 31 patients before eventually getting caught. She spent the remainder of her days laying alone, thankfully, in an asylum. Number four, Linda Hazard. Her last name really tried to tip us off here. She has since been dubbed the starvation doctor because back in the day, the late 1800s, that is, if you somehow ended up in the office of Hazard, it doesn't really matter what you're there for. Linda's advice, no matter what, her medical advice, her professional advice for everything was too fast. Right, yeah, your knee's dislocated, eh, no problem. Just skip lunch, see how you feel. More than 40 of her patients died due to, well, you guessed it, starvation. And she even had her own sanitarium in Washington appropriately named Starvation Heights. You would think that after 16 deaths caused by starvation at a place called Starvation Heights, people would start asking questions. Now, eventually Hazard was caught, convicted, and served two years in prison. But 26 years later, in 1938, she herself died of starvation. You played yourself, Linda. Number three, Thomas Cream. This next one, again, hits close to home for us in Canada. Thomas Neil Cream originally graduated from McGill in 1876, and after that, he traveled to London, England. London, England, not London, Ontario. Definitely, definitely didn't travel there. The other one's way better. This was during the time of the Industrial Revolution as well, so the demand for doctors was quite high. Thomas was there for business and apparently he was there for pleasure. He enjoyed London's nightlife. He would dance, drink, and hook up with strangers. Just, you know, all the things you don't want your medical doctor doing hours before a procedure. On November 15th, 1892, there were thousands gathered outside the Newgate prison walls, eagerly awaiting the execution of one Dr. Thomas Cream. Boom, well, what happened? Well, he's now referred to as the Lambeth Poisoner. We got another poisoner on this horrible list. If you had the misfortune of seeing this guy, odds are he would have just tried to poison you no matter what you went in there for. Just because. He just liked to do it. What a monster. He actually did get caught once. He was convicted of poisoning a woman once. He was given life in prison, but it's all about who you know, right? His brother ended up bribing the governor of Illinois at that point, so he poisoned five more people after in London before eventually getting caught and arrested again. And then finally, this time around, he was executed. And this time around, there was also a crowd. Rightfully so. Number two, Michael Swango. When he was just a child, Michael Swango did not collect rocks. He didn't spin Beyblades with friends. He didn't have Pokemon cards or anything like that. Instead, he had scrapbooks filled with horrible car accidents or any crime scene that's awful to look at would be in the scrapbook as if there weren't any red flags there alone with what I just said when Michael got to college he decided to write his chemistry thesis on Georgi Markov and more specifically he studied his horrific death caused by you guessed it poison he was fascinated after that point he had a newfound obsession and it was poisons and how they silently took lives this was intriguing to somebody now during his third year at school five patients that had the misfortune of seeing him just happened to die afterwards big mystery hmm his classmates actually had a nickname for him which is horrible they called him double o in reference to james bond 007 but more of a reference to license to kill you think people would ask questions i don't know after an internship people of course were dying off but one individual luckily survived and she remembered a few important details she remembered that Swango had injected her with something just a minute before she started experiencing seizures. He still got away with it somehow, and then later he went to another hospital in Ohio in 1984, handed out donuts that made the staff sick, and then when they required treatment, he would help them, but really he'd poison them. He got caught then, was sentenced to five years, but was released after two. He then changed his name, moved to Virginia, got a job as a career counselor, and poisoned those co-workers as well. He got caught again again after doing this like three more times, and now he's serving three life sentences at ADX Supermax Federal Prison. This is actually insane. If I told you everything that he actually got away with, like I crunched it down, this video would be too long if I included it all. You'd think it was a marathon here on Most Amazing. Nope, just the horrible acts of one Michael Swan. And finally, number one, H.H. H. Holmes. H.H. H. Holmes was of an absolute monster, just a horrible human being. His fascination with medicine started at a young age as well. He used to perform these surgeries on stuffed animals, which is just, again, red flags. It's never been confirmed, but it's highly believed that his first victim was one of his first friends. HH went to go on to medical school, and shortly after finishing, he began killing people in order to steal their property. How insane is that? He then built himself this huge, horrifying home, this house that had like tunnels and trap doors and doors that locked from the outside and all that super villain crap. He even had 
had to kill him to cremate these bodies in his house. That's, you know what I'm talking about, one of those guys? I think it's safe to say he was absolutely the worst person on this list. I mean, not that we're trying to compare, but kind of hard to be more evil than this guy. Not only would he get close to women to take control of their finances and then kill them afterwards, but he would also require his employees to take out life insurance policies that named him as a beneficiary. Some of these bodies he ended up selling to medical schools, which is just... I can't even go down that road of huh. Eventually he was found out, luckily, and he was caught and sentenced to death. Now it's not exactly known how many victims he had, but it's thought to be somewhere in the 200 range. Disgusting, right? That's what this list is all about. In our number 10 spot, we have Johan Conrad Dippel. Dippel was a scientist that is known for creating the elixir of life. An elixir that, yes, would keep you living for as long as you would like. It was called Dippel's oil. He tried to trade the elixir for Frankenstein's castle once, Obviously, the owners didn't fall for it. Or at least they didn't believe in its worth. But I bet you're wondering, why was he thought to be so evil? Well, probably because he used to experiment on himself and dead bodies. And he claimed that he even transferred the soul of one body to another, even though no one could ever confirm this as the bodies were, well deceased. He also claimed to have a way of releasing demons from bodies. Man, I wonder if that's documented anywhere. We can all use an exercise for releasing demons, you know what I mean? In our number 9 spot, we have Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons is known for being a rocket scientist, but also a follower of the occultist Aleister Crowley. He is believed to be someone who was in direct contact with the devil and did experiments, aka spells, on on himself. He was the reason for the advancement of liquid fuel and solid fuel rockets. He was unable to continue being a scientist when news of his occult ways became public knowledge. Apparently he worked with the founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, to summon the god Babylon to Earth. He died in an at-home explosion from an experiment that he was doing. Jack is a tricky one because obviously everyone was so Christian and Catholic back then that they would have thought him to be evil, but I don't know. I really wonder if this is one of those cases where, you know, they were wrong and maybe he was just a nice guy. I don't know. In our number eight spot, we have the Tuskegee scientists. The scientists that participated in this experiment are legit pure evil. There was a study done called the Tuskegee study where 600 African American males, 399 who were suffering with syphilis and 201 who weren't, and these men were being tricked into thinking that they were being treated for the illness, when really they were dying off, except the ones that didn't have it, of course. They were the success stories, of course. But what was the purpose of this? Well, to study their corpses. They couldn't have thought to just ask them if they could study their bodies once they die. Why did this happen, and even for as long as it did, which was 40 years, from 1932 to 1972? So evil. Reparations were eventually paid to the victims of the study, but nothing could make up for the horrible feeling they must have felt from going through that experience. In our number 7 spot, we have Dr. Sigmund Rascher. This is a scientist that needed to be mentioned because of how evil he was. However, it is unclear as to whether he experimented on himself at all throughout his life. Rasher is considered one of the most evil scientists in the world from World War II. He worked at a camp and apparently experimented on 300 unwilling people in high altitude freezing experiments. Victims were locked in a pressure chamber where the altitude was being continuously adjusted and they would feel as if they were falling out of a plane. He would also place them in freezing environments naked to perform tests. Of course, this led to many deaths. He was asked to do this on monkeys, but demanded humans. Clearly a very sick and awful man. In our number 6 spot, we have Shiro Ishii. There is a man that is known as Surgeon General Shiro Ishii, and he was a scientist and medical officer for the Japanese Imperial Army. In fact, he led the biological warfare unit that is known as 731. He's also known for being just plain evil as he would experiment on Chinese prisoners and regular civilians. He used biological weapons that is said to have caused tens of thousands of deaths, including the bubonic plague, cholera, and anthrax. He would also conduct other evil experiments on his patients, including forced ab 
and simulated hypothermia. It is unclear if he experimented on himself as I'm sure he wouldn't have given himself the bubonic plague, but it is clear that he was very, very evil. In our number 5 spot we have Max Joseph von Pettenkofer. Max was a scientist that wasn't so much evil as he was seemingly insane as he did an extremely risky experiment on himself. Apparently in 1892 he wanted to disprove the theory that cholera bacteria alone was the cause of the disease. In the presence of witnesses, Max swallowed some broth with a large dose of cholera bacteria. He apparently also consumed some sodium biocarbonate to neutralize the acids in his stomach after it was suggested that the acid could kill the bacteria. Apparently he suffered only minor symptoms and what he did experience he says wasn't due to the bacteria. To me he just sounds like he was either a little insane or just so sure of himself that it wasn't a risk at all. And even then, I would say to be that sure of yourself to take that big of a risk means you have to be a little insane. In our number 4 spot we have Klauberg, another man who is known to be one of the most evil scientists in the world. Klauberg was a scientist in World War II that started off experimenting on himself but then eventually switched to experimenting on a large amount of women in camps and what was his purpose? Oh, to sterilize them all. He apparently experimented on hundreds injecting formaldehyde into their stomachs without any painkillers, as well as it is said that he also injected animal sperm into some of the women to see if he could create an animal human hybrid. Absolutely horrifying. In our number 3 spot we have Joseph Mengel, another German scientist from World War II that was said to have had evil intentions. He weirdly had an interest in young humans humans and twins and a lot of his experimentation was around them. The most disturbing thing about him was his ability to seem so kind and charming and have everyone like him, but then in the next moment he would be the reason a bunch of people were sentenced to death. A true psychopath and it's the seemingly kind ones that always leave you with shivers. He has a nickname and is known as the angel of death. In our number 2 spot we have Peter Neubauer. In the 60s and 70s a secret experiment was was done led by a scientist by the name of Peter Neubauer that separated twins and triplets from each other and they were adopted as singles. Apparently this experiment was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and the purpose of this experiment is still unclear. To separate living humans from their family all for the sake of science is truly just evil in my opinion. The experiment was discovered in the 80s after three identical brothers accidentally found each other. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like to be them. I suppose this experiment isn't as horrible as some of the other ones we have listed today, but it still is terribly sad to think about all of these people, you know, missing out on growing up with their brothers and sisters. It is unclear whether Peter's decision to lead this was part of his job and therefore through slight force, as it was being funded by a big organization, or whether he pushed for this to be done. In our number one spot, we have Vladimir Demikov. So this is in my personal opinion one of the most evil scientists but honestly there are so many evil ones on this list that it's really hard to say who should take first. So I'm giving it to Vladimir Demikov. Vladimir is a Soviet scientist that is known for performing the evil act of beheading many dogs and then re-sewing them onto other dogs bodies. He did this for 15 years. Why? Oh, because apparently he was bored. Apparently he was known to experiment on himself and also he pioneered organ transplants which is just so hard to digest that he could have been the founder of something that has done so much good for the world while on the other hand he committed unthinkable evil acts. Life is so strange. 